Yeah. So, so luteal in an ovulatory well. cycle, when if we're when we're healthy, when we're you know younger than forty, we should be having if we're not on hormonal birth control, we should be having every month a couple weeks of strong progesterone production, and that helps to lighten periods. That is usually quite good for mood, although there's a little bit of nuance Very. around that. But mm. <laughs> generally, progesterone for most women is a little bit tranquilizing. Well, you've got lots of it right now. Like so, second, <laughs> like second trimester pregnancy is usually quite tranquilizing. I mean, it, again, it can vary. There's other factors, but um, and then, but with the the on the journey to perimenopause, we just start our ovulation just becomes less robust. This is it's nothing you've done wrong, right? Like in my first book, I talk about all the ways to promote healthy ovulation, and we still want to do that. And I in mm. my new book, I have a chapter called "Cycle While well, You Can." You still want to ovulate as best you can for as long as possible and always remove any obstacles to ovulation and but also accept the fact that ovulations are becoming less robust eventually they're going to stop that's normal mm. so with this reduction in progesterone with shorter luteal phases uh, maybe a shift to having more anovulatory cycles or cycles where you don't ovulate but still bleed um we make less progesterone and the, that feels like trouble sleeping, mm. increased migraines, increased anxiety potentially, and heavier periods as well, which we might not go into today. We'll see if we have time. But like that often there can be heavy periods going along with all of this. So mm. the, we lose progesterone, which is one of the reasons taking progesterone, not a progestin in the pill, but like natural actually, progesterone can be yeah. actually very helpful but at the same time we're getting in the er, in fa the for early phases of perimenopause and there's four phases which i give a little chart in the book but in the earlier phases which in total last you know four or five years we're also getting potentially estrogen higher than ever before up to three times higher than before mm. and spiking up and down and you can't really measure that with a blood test because it's all over the place like but you, you know from symptoms and from some of the testing like um, research that Professor Pryor has done, as you can see, there's like big estrogen spikes. And along with estrogen spiking up high can come this whole immune system reaction that I talk about in the book of high histamine, and which is also mm, very, very mast cell, cell activation yeah. and very – this in part is the perimenopausal allergies and it's um, headaches and irritability and – like hive sometimes or urticaria sometimes like there's, there's definitely an immune thing mm. going on that can feel terrible and that I have noticed sometimes gets called estrogen dominance although I don't really use that word but that's that kind of high estrogen immune stimulated picture with no very little progesterone sometimes to counterbalance that mm. and so that's the first phases <laughs> and that is not not pleasant um and that affects, sorry, so that affects the nervous system. That's where some of the other anxiety symptoms come from is that high estrogen, mm. high histamine, plus then estrogen's on a roller coaster. Then you get some estrogen withdrawal symptoms leading up to the period, which also doesn't feel very good. That's where the night sweats come from is estrogen dropping from high to low. Mm -hmm. So you low, saying, est low well, estrogen. You're saying it's kind yeah. of addictive. Yeah. I just, I want to quickly yeah, jump yeah. in there because I thought that was interesting. Um I'd never thought of it that yeah. way. I suppose estrogen is addictive. Yeah. Yeah. So when For the brain. so when when we're yeah. swinging, yeah, this kind of the low is like a withdrawal. Yeah, like, we get like, estrogen withdrawal. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's not pleasant. And just to reassure, like just to it was perfect timing with your question because I was about to say that if like once we get into that menopause phase, like stable low estrogen, not no estrogen, we still make mm. actually quite a quite a lot of estrogen still, but. Um, we don't get hot flushes and night sweats because it's not the like up and down, mm -hmm. you know, crashing down part of the estrogen roller coasters. So a lot of it comes from estrogen withdrawal and also the estrogen addiction side of things. It's worth mentioning that if, if women do take estrogen therapy, and I think it's fine to take it, like I just want to say, like I'm not, I'm, you know, in general pro hormone therapy, not everyone needs it, but I think it's reasonable Useful. to mm -hmm. take that. Um, just one thing to understand that if and when you decide to stop it, 
you have to taper down estrogen. You can't, like I've had patients who they want to take a break and so they just stop it immediately and of course get hot flushes back because mm -hmm. you're going through estrogen withdrawal. That doesn't really tell you anything about your underlying need for it. Yeah. 